All right. So I want to begin by telling you a story. And uh, sitting in this room, uh, it, I, there have been so many times I've spoken in this room with translations that I speak a sentence in here and I expect to hear a translator from over there. So uh, just to keep talking, here's a little bit of a different experience for me. About uh, two and a half months ago, uh, Don Masucci came back from a ministry trip and she came to visit with me. She said, I have an amazing story to tell you. I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, I was at this particular location in Wyoming. And she says, this person that I didn't even know, and it, was a, it is a major YWAM location. She said, this person that I didn't even know walked up to me, and out of the blue, when she found out that Don worked with the SBS, she said, oh, you're Don Masucci. Good. I've been looking for somebody in the SBS to ask this question of you. Why does the SBS hate Jews? <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I'm a Jew here. What, what do you say to that when somebody has never even met you? And that's the first words out of their mouth as they're getting to know you. Why do you hate Jews? <laughs> Let me tell you why. <laughs> mm. Don had a great response. She said, well, uh, she knew that this response was very important, how she was going to respond. She said, well, she said in the SBS, we simply believe that everybody in the world needs Jesus. And she said, we are centered on Jesus. And, and the interesting thing was it kind of just diffused that whole statement. And so I want to first of all just talk to you about criticism that has come to us through the years about Jews. And I'm so glad this is being recorded and going on the web because uh, people need to know. That's not the first such accusation that has come my way through the years. Several years back, I was speaking in Sweden, in Scandinavia. And they invited Judy and me to talk about Revelation and 2 Thessalonians and about the end times. It was a big thing with many churches. And just a wonderful area that's really on fire for God. And so they asked me to, I was teaching 2 Thessalonians, Judy was doing Revelation. And in the middle of it, one of the leaders of the conference, and it was all pastors, it was like 200, 250 pastors. In the middle of the kind of leaders. In the middle of the conference, one of the, one of the kind of chairman of the organization that was putting this thing on, came to me and he said, many of these are wanting to know if you would be willing to have a special session on Saturday afternoon where you talk about Israel. Sure, I'd be glad to talk about Israel. So I go and I have this special session on Saturday afternoons, on this one Saturday afternoon talking about Israel. In the middle of my talk, there was a pastor in the back of the room and just blurted this out, just said it right in the middle of what I was saying. He said, you are anti-Semitic. Right? I'm a Jew hater. And I had heard this so many times through the years, right, that I thought, am I going to just let this go by or am I going to respond to it? Now, let me just, well, let me tell you how I, res uh, yeah, let me tell you how I, I responded and then let me tell you the background of why people say what they said, or have said it. So I was listening to this pastor say all this stuff, and you got a person saying this publicly about you, right? Totally untrue. But... And so I said, well, let me talk to you a bit about that. I said, in the, the eschatology that you hold, right? That, and that's the perspective that these people are coming from. It's purely an eschatology thing. That... I, don't, I am not of the opinion, right, that something special is going to happen to Israel in the future and that God spoke all of these prophecies in the Old Testament and that's why in 1948 they became a country and all of that. I just don't see that in the scriptures. And because of that, I'm anti-Semitic. So in the eschatology that these people hold, 
They believe, well, I'll just kind of show you a little bit of it. This is what I got my doctorate in, right? So I really do know this. They believe, right, that we've got the millennium, the 1,000 year reign of Christ that's going to be physical. Jesus is going to reign here on a throne in Jerusalem. And in the seven or so years that precede that, there's going to be all kinds of tribulation specifically for the Jewish people, right? And also these people believe, let's see if I can find a different color, that before that tribulation, we in the church are going to be taken on a heavenly elevator ride and we're going to be up there in heaven. We're going to be at a banquet for seven years getting all kinds of rewards and good stuff and I mean, life is a living hell for the Jews here on earth, but we're up there and then we come back and on and on. That's their understanding of the way the end of the world is going to go down. Well, I don't believe that. <clears throat> so, during this time, these Jews are having all of these problems. I mean, some of the things that have been said about them are amazing. For instance, let me give you two or three quotations. One quotation is that when this seven-year period occurs, it's going to make Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy. Right? What Hitler did will be like he was a choir boy compared to what's going to happen to the Jews in the future. Some people have said it's going to be, if you think the furnaces were hot the first time, you wait to see what happens the second time to them. It's going to be far worse. That's what these people are saying who are calling me anti-Semitic. And so finally, I, you know, I'm just over the top. So I just decided, you know what? I'm going to tell, tell these guys. <laughs> you know, they're begging for a fright, so I'm going to strip down and we're going to do this thing right here, right? So I said to this pastor, I said, let me tell you something. I said, you are the person that says the Jews are going back to the furnaces. You are the person that says they're going to be dying by the millions again. I'm not saying that. You're saying that and you're calling me anti-Semitic. You're telling me I hate Jews and you're the one telling it, the whole world they're going back to the furnaces and I'm the one that hates them. I said, let me tell you what a rabbi has written and said about people like you. I just went off. I said, let me tell you what a rabbi has said about people like you. He said, with friends like you, who needs the PLO? PLO was a Palestinian liberation organization. It was a group dedicated to wipe out Jews. This rabbi said, with friends like that guy's eschatology, who needs those guys, right? The room went extremely quiet. Well, this whole anti, this whole thing about I hate Jews has gone on for years, but I have to actually laugh at this now because that's the only time I've ever responded to that charge for me or for the SBS, but I just, it was public and it was, it was just so demeaning. But something rather humorous has happened over the last year in my life that I've got to tell you about. <laughs> so, when I was a little boy growing up, my family was constantly telling us that we were related to an American, one of the American founding fathers named Benjamin Franklin. Everybody on my mother's side of the family has a last name, Franklin. And if you look at the history of that name, uh, it's very clear that that name has very clear Jewish roots. Do you remember the uh, book that was made into a movie titled The Diary of Anne Frank, right? It's that, it's that group of people that all of my ancestors are related to. And a scholar at one of the major universities in the United States has recently done a study. Her name is Elizabeth Hirschman. And she has done a background study on several of the founding fathers in the United States. And one of the conclusions that she came to was that Benjamin Franklin came from a family line of Jewish people who were originally in Spain and during the Inquisition they fled Spain to the north, went to England and Scotland, and then came to the United States. And there was, a whole, there was a whole clan of people that had Frank or Frankel 
as the root for their last name. And of course, Franklin is just a part of it. Well, guess that, what that makes me. <laughs> what that means is I have Jewish blood in me. And so I was telling this to Judy, right? I've got the book that Elizabeth Hirschman has written. It's all in there. And so I was telling this to Judy. I said, Judy, I'm going to say this to people. That people need to know that I've got Jewish blood in me. And, and that for them to say that I hate Jews, they need to understand you know, who they're saying this to. Um, she said, ah. Oh. She said, if you tell people that, they're just going to say, oh, you got this thing about yourself. You actually hate yourself. That's the problem. You hate yourself. And then I thought, well, even better. If they're going to say I hate myself, then they're going to say I hate my grandmother because her name was Franklin. And the bottom line is, uh, the scripture teaches, as we all know from the book of Romans, salvation is not based on what ethnic group or bloodlines we're in. God loves the whole world, and he wants to save the whole world the same way, right? It gets better for me, though. Let me go one step further. And that is, when I got sick three years ago, they took me right down here to the McKay Hospital. And they pumped so much Chinese blood into me <laughs> that I am Chinese now, too, which is awesome. <laughs> and then when I left here, I got on an airplane and flew to the United States to the southern part of the U.S. and pumped another six bags of blood in me. And I am quite certain that I also have African-American blood in me. So I've got the Jews, and I got the Chinese, and I got the African-Americans. It is awesome. Uh, What's that? Uh, That's right, I got it all. So I think it's important as we kind of open this up that you understand that the kinds of attacks that can come against us are brutal and there's nothing good about them. Now, it's not only attacks. There are criticisms that are coming our way at times. And I don't mean just the SBS, I mean us personally, that are correct, that the criticisms are deserved, right? And so we ask ourselves, well, how do I respond to those, right? And what I would like to suggest is that there are, there are things that I think we can consider in criticism that before we just respond and before we start just turning inward and all those things that we are inclined to do, that we want to think about a few things in a bigger perspective than simply people are saying things about me that I don't think are just or correct or, or valid, right? So let me, let me just begin by giving you six thoughts on, on criticism and six thoughts on people coming to say things to us that are less than fun. All right, so one of the things that I would point out to you, if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, and verse 11. Isn't that crazy? I got Jewish blood in me. I just think that is absolutely hilarious knowing the numbers of people who have said this about me. I just. Revelation 12 11. All right, let's take a look. And they have conquered him. I'm sorry, 1210. Uh, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him three ways. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives to the death. All right, look at verse 10. Notice what Satan is called here, and he's called it once in a noun and once as a verb. He's the accuser of the brethren who accuses us day and night. All right, so we think about this idea of criticism. One of the things I would like to suggest is if the criticism has been authored in hell, it's especially important that we consider these two things. Now, let's, and it, this goes for good criticism, where it would be godly or ungodly criticism. It's important that we remember this. People are watching us. 
If you're in a place of responsibility in the body, be you a school leader or a staff person, people are watching. And that's the way God made the universe. That we have been called to be glorious. And the word glory in both Hebrew and Greek means that we capture the attention of people. So there's nothing wrong with people watching us in leadership, which also means what we've heard this morning, that we be exemplary in the way we lead. Now let me suggest that as they watch us, and especially <laughs> when we get criticized, people are going to watch two things. They're going to first watch the behavior. They are going to evaluate, well, have I seen that in that person or not? Right? So they're going to first evaluate the critic, right? <laughs> But the next thing I'm going to tell you is so crucial that you don't want to miss it. And that is that people are going to watch the way we respond to the criticism. And that is huge. How do I respond? So that's, that, that's important for us to, to remember that if we're going to lead people, they're going to watch. They're going to watch the behavior. And they're going to watch our response to criticism. That's number one. Number two, some of the criticisms or, shall we say, disagreements or negative words that come our way are legitimate. And what that means is that there, there's got to be a place for a humble attitude where we at least listen to what people are saying and then, then try to begin to evaluate, all right, is this true? Is it 12% true? Is it 80% true? Maybe it's not true at all. Right? But there is a place where some of them are legitimate. And, and, and we see in Scripture where truly godly people did not listen to somebody that totally disagreed with something they were doing and it cost him his life. Now I'm talking about King Josiah. Remember when the king came out? Pharaoh Necho? He came out the king of Egypt. And Josiah was going north to meet Nebuchadnezzar. Or no, Necho was going north to meet Nebuchadnezzar. Josiah came out to stop him. And Necho said, don't stop me. He said, God has sent me to do this. <clears throat> Josiah did not listen. And he ended up dying. Now think about that. A totally godless, heathen Pharaoh, who once a year would decree himself to be God in Egypt, would publicly have sex with a temple prostitute, and now he's going north to meet an equally godless person, Nebuchadnezzar, and here comes Josiah out to meet that guy. This man says, God has sent me. Josiah no doubt thought, right. You don't care about God. What is this God talk? And it cost him his life. Man, what that should do for every one of us is it should cause us to consider what people say to us when they come our way with something that is not reassuring or comforting at all. It's painful. We don't want to just throw it out. Neither do we want to just accept, accept it. We do need to evaluate it. Now, let me just say to you, what I'm saying here is a lot easier to talk about than to do. All right, the third one. Remember, I'm giving you six thoughts here, and then I'm going to tell you some more stories that will make you smile. All right, the third one. Some, some criticisms that come our way are illegitimate. They're totally off the wall, engineered by Satan to hurt us, to discourage us. You find in the book of Ecclesiastes that it says that we should not listen to everything that people say to us. Now, it's very interesting in the wisdom literature. You ever thought this about the wisdom literature? When you look at Proverbs, 
and, and Ecclesiastes to a lesser extent, but really Proverbs, you think about how much Proverbs tells us it's important to listen to people. We've got to be humble. We've got to have an inclined ear. We've got to be willing to listen to people. That's, that's, shall we say, the basic posture. But Ecclesiastes also tells us there is a balance and there is a time where we shouldn't listen to everything people say to us or say about us. So that's the third thing. All right, the fourth thing is very interesting and may prove frustrating for some of you that came to this meeting thinking I was going to give you a lot of answers. I think I will give you some, but I'm not going to give you probably as many as are going to make you happy. But the fourth point I would like to make for you is there is no formula in how to answer criticism and how to respond. I believe that we've got, we've got to listen to God in each of these circumstances and he may direct us differently in different circumstances. And let me show you where I see this in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26. Verses 4 and 5. Wow, this is remarkable. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Look at the very next verse. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. You know what the writer of this book is telling us? That there is a time when you don't want to answer somebody that tells you something ridiculous. And that there is another time where you may need to do it, right? So this is why I'm saying that there's no formula, that, that it's, shall we say, circumstantially specific. And we've got to, we really have to ask God and, and just ask Him for His wisdom and His insight in this particular circumstance where we are being criticized. And there can be a whole host of reasons why uh, God would give us different answers, let's say, for almost the identical circumstance with a different person or in a different context. And those would be the personality of the players involved. Right? Let's say that we're being criticized by a person who just finds it very easy just to speak their mind and, and they are really able right, to deliver a punch, but they're also able to take one. And it's just, they just speak you know, what's, what they really think, and you can turn around and hit them just as easy, right back, and it's no big deal. Then there are other people who, for them to speak any kind of a negative word into another person's life, I mean, God almost has to push them to the floor and get their heart beating really fast and hard, and they come talk to you about something, and their face is flushed, and they just don't want to say it. Right? It would be a nightmare then to turn around and just give something right back to them. So... That's why I think it's important for us to think about specific circumstances because the personalities involved. Then we think cross-culturally, right? Wow. You go to Northern Europe, you go to Denmark, you go to Scandinavia, you go to Sweden, you go to some of the, you go to the, some of the Germans, Swiss Germans. Wow, it's really simple. Man, you sit down, you go right across the table at somebody, and they expect you to come right back across the table with them, and it's good. Then you walk out and go drink coffee together. I'm telling you, you take that to Thailand, and you have yourself a train wreck. Right? So we've got to think in terms of culture. Right? Even in the United States, there are parts of the United States that are very confrontational, and parts of the United States that are a lot more like Thailand. Even in marriages. Right? You can get American married. My wife and I are a classic example. I am very indirect. My wife, direct is the understatement of the last two weeks. I, I mean, she is really direct. And I would say that my indirectness is just as parallel, just, just as extreme. Do you know when I asked her to marry me, she did not even know I was asking her to marry me. I'm not kidding. Two weeks went by after I asked her. 
and she had said nothing to me about yes, no, or maybe. She just didn't even say anything about it. And so I went to her two weeks after I had asked her. And I said, Judy, I mean, even the next question I asked her is very indirect. I said, Judy, you know, I asked you that question two weeks ago, and you haven't even said anything to me at all about it. I, I said, what's the deal? She said, she said, what are you talking about? <laughs> she didn't even know it. I mean, we'd have gone on the whole summer. This is in the summer of 1975. We'd have gone the whole summer, and she would never answered me if I hadn't brought it up again. Yeah, so that's the way I asked her. I said, you know that question I asked you two weeks ago? You haven't even said anything about it. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I said well, about us getting married. And she said, well, are you asking me? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I am. She said, well, I'm going to have to think about it. <laughs> now, you, you look at that. You see the difference of how direct she is and how indirect I am. You get into the middle of these circumstances where somebody criticizes somebody else and somebody else is wanting to give feedback. If this is not done with a lot of finesse and diplomacy and really forethought and prayer and even sitting about and thinking about the choice of words, we can turn something into a mess. And so I would say that's another thing that's very important about there not being any, shall we say, formulas here. That's number four. There is no formula. So then if that's the issue, somebody said to me at a break this morning, which I thought was so good, I had to add, add it to my points. Number five, well, okay, if that's the case, how do we know whether what's coming to us is legit or is not legit, I mean, how do we know this? Right? It's a good I think that's a great question. And I think this is where we have to cultivate friends close to us that we know love, just love us. That we can ask them. I had this person say that to me. What do you think? And we know that they're going to tell us the truth. Right? So the question on how do we know, first of all, is to pray and say, okay, God, is that right? Is what this person said to me, about me, or about our work, correct? And so then we can ask people we trust. And I, I can just say to you that, that we want to be really careful if we are going to give other people feedback on their behavior when they come and say, well, do you think this is true? But we want to pray and ask God to put his fear into our heart before we respond to that, right? Because more than once, I have told friends that I love, what you just did was very disrespectful. And, you know, for me, tone of voice is a big deal. And I tell them, you know, your tone of voice is terrible. I, I just want it on. And these humble friends would go and confess it to whatever group of people they had said something to, and the other group had not even taken offense at it, right? And so here I've got my good friend, I've said this, and now I've got this to deal with, right? And in some ways, mine was an illegitimate judgment and correction of that other person, right? So I think we just have to be very careful if people ask us for feedback, that we say, okay, Lord, help me to tell them the truth, but put your fear in my heart, because I do not want to discourage a person I don't want to hurt a person. But I think the way we can get feedback is to ask people that we know and trust. And the last thing that is so big, I, I can't overestimate what I'm just getting ready to tell you, is when we think about criticism in the body of Christ, when we think about ourselves being criticized or our friends being criticized, I think we need to, to make it a lifelong goal to be encouragers of our brothers and sisters. To be encouragers. And what I would like to suggest is different people <laughs> receive encouragement in different ways. And what I mean by that is some people can be encouraged by a word you just go and speak directly to them face to face. And you give them the word. 
and they, it just really builds them up. Some people are not so encouraged by that, but the way they're encouraged is by a handwritten note. Right? Here's an interesting one. I was reading the I was reading a textbook on communication by a communication psychologist. And he suggested a third way that some people are, in, are encouraged. And this is one that I had never thought of, but I have used since I learned it from him. And th this, is, this one takes strategy. And this is why I think we need to pray and ask the Lord to help make us better encouragers. Some people are encouraged by hearing about something good that they did or some area they need to be encouraged in. They are encouraged by hearing it secondhand. For instance, let's say that uh, JD has done something super, right? And so I'm wanting to encourage him, but in living with JD and walking with him for a while in my life in ministry, I realized JD is one of these guys who really, the way he gets encouraged is to hear it secondhand. So what I would do is I would talk to Byron and I'd say, you know, Byron, knowing that Byron was going to see JD, right? So I'd say to Byron, I said, man, J.D. just did this thing that was just absolutely off the charts incredible. I mean, he was so good at doing it. Well, the next time they get together and Byron says, oh, hey, I heard you did this thing. And Ron just said, that thing was incredible. Some people, the way their, their psychological makeup is, that's the way they are encouraged, is they are encouraged by hearing something secondhand. You know, there was, a, there was a study done where they actually would set up subjects in a psychological study where they would be, let's say, sitting at a booth in a restaurant and they would put other people in a booth right behind them but make, it, make the acoustics such that they could hear what the others were saying back and forth. And what they found were that there were a whole group of subjects that were by far more greatly affected by what they overheard people saying about them than if somebody came and spoke something directly to them. So we want to be, we, we want to be cognizant of this, that there are some people that the best way we can encourage them is by telling one of their close friends just how incredible they were, knowing that that friend is going to go tell them. That takes strategy, doesn't it? And we're thinking now about how to silence the accuser, right? I mean, this takes strategy. And in my opinion, encouragement is a part of the prophetic gift we find. Look with me if you would at 1 Corinthians 14. It is a gift of the Spirit. And is subsumed under the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14. And verse 3. Paul says, on the other hand, he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. He who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So notice that one of the functions of prophecy is to encourage people. So if you've ever prayed that God would give you the gift of prophecy, well, one of the ways you can exercise it, and you can ask God to help you exercise it, is to begin to pray that God will help you to be a better encourager. And I, I want that for myself. I want to be a better encourager, right? Because I do know that this is one thing that we can do in the body of Christ. First of all, that there's not enough of. I don't think, let me ask this question. Is there anybody in the room who feels that in your life and ministry, you have been encouraged too much? <laughs> there you have it, right? So, what that means then is that we can ask God, Lord, help me in this whole idea of being a good encourager. And it means that God will literally want to develop a ministry and a strategy and all of that in our lives to be that person. You know the cool thing about that? You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to be able to sing. You don't have to be able to preach. All you have to be able to do is to say something nice to somebody. Right? But of course, under the guidance of the Spirit. All right, one other thought about encouragement, and we'll take a break. Studies have found 
that encouraging a person at a time, I'm talking a time of day or a time in the week or month or in their life, encouraging a, a person when they don't expect it, kind of random encouragement. Don talked about this yesterday, and I talked with her after she said it, because there have been psychological studies that have been done that when we encourage a person when they don't expect it, it has huge impact in a positive way. Just out of the blue, they get a note from us or an encouraging word. It is a big deal. So I would encourage you in this asking the Lord to make you the kind of prophetic person that you want to be. That you ask God to help you in the timing of that to hit people when they're not expecting it. That is a cool thing. Right? Now there are times, of course, when it's good to encourage a person to preach or whatever. Of course, sometimes people need that right afterwards. But I think we want to ask the Lord, okay, God, what would be the best time for me to say this? And one of the things that the studies have shown, the same psychologist who talked about this, said that one of the places where people at times can have the greatest amount of psychological benefit, and for us it would be spiritual as well, is when they are encouraged in an area that they feel weak in. And that you have caught them doing something in that area where they feel weak, where you can legitimately encourage them. I'm telling you, we do that, and it will just put spring in their step and a light in their eye. Right? Now why is this important as we're thinking about criticism? Because I do believe that God's response to criticism is encouragement. That's his response. And, and think about this. Whether it's legitimate criticism, stuff we deserved. Well, if it's if we're taking a hit for something we deserve, and, and all of a sudden the lights come on and we realize, yeah, goodness, I didn't do that well at all. We need encouragement after that. And if we take a hit for something we don't deserve, we know good and well where that came from. Then we need a word from the Lord which would be a word of encouragement, a word of prophecy. So what is it? you see where this takes us? It takes us to spiritual warfare. That what we're seeing then is God's response to criticism. 